The title of this chapter is Applications of Aqueous Equilibrium, and given how much we've talked about acid-base processes, buffers, so on and so forth, you may think this is all about acid-base chemistry. Not the case. We're going to transition now to talking about solubility equilibria, and actually revisiting a reaction that was probably one of the first chemical reactions that you learned about in your chemistry education, dissolution and precipitation. There is a limit to how much a solid salt can dissolve in a solvent. And we're going to be talking about water. The chapter is, after all, called aqueous equilibrium. So we're going to be talking about solutions in water. At some point, as we add more and more solid to a solvent like water, we eventually reach a situation where the solid refuses to dissolve further into solution. So we've got solute particles dissolved in the solution, but there is additional solid left over at the bottom of the beaker. And if we could blow up what's going on here and look at the molecular level, what we would see is that on the interface between the solid and aqueous particles, let's imagine we've got a relatively regular array of solid particles here, solute particles are going to be coming and going off of this solid surface at a rapid rate. And we've achieved equilibrium in this situation when the rates of dissolution, that is, particles leaving the solid phase and going into the aqueous phase, and precipitation, that the process of an aqueous particle latching onto the, the solid, are equal. When the rates of dissolution and precipitation are equal, we're in a state of equilibrium. That's just the definition of chemical equilibrium that we saw back in a previous chapter, right? In that situation, there is some concentration of the solute in solution, and this is the maximum amount of solute that can dissolve. It's called the molar solubility. It's expressed as a concentration, so we measure it in something like moles per liter, or more commonly for solutions like this, you'll see it in grams per liter, some mass unit, just for practical use. And if we think in particular about an ionic solid, something that has, let's say, a metal cation and a non-metal anion, the process of dissolution and precipitation involves, on the dissolution direction, the solid dissociating into aqueous ions, let's say M plus aqueous and X minus aqueous, and in the reverse direction, the precipitation direction, M plus and X minus, are getting together to form the MX solid. So we can kind of color code this given our previous drawing. The reverse direction is the precipitation process, while the forward direction is the dissolution process on the molecular level. The equilibrium constant for dissolution and precipitation is called KSP, the solubility product. And this is a, a fairly interesting equilibrium constant if you think about dissolution and precipitation. In particular, we can notice that MX is a solid, so it shouldn't appear in the equilibrium expression for KSP, right? In this case, KSP is going to be equal to the concentration of M plus in solution at equilibrium times the concentration of X minus at equilibrium, but no reactants appear in the equilibrium constant, only products. So we're dividing by one, and so I'll just leave that out. This is a fairly simple example, but you do need to keep in mind that when the solid salt MX includes multiple metal cations or nonmetal anions, we need to account for the stoichiometry both in the balanced chemical equation and in the KSP expression. So you may have squared, cubed, or even to the fourth power terms in the equilibrium expression for KSP. But now that we have this definition in hand, we can apply all the former tools of equilibrium that we've used before. So, for example, we can build an ice table. We can go from the molar solubility, which in fact tells us these equilibrium concentrations, M plus and X minus, back to the KSP. On the other hand, we can go from KSP back to the molar solubility by applying the equilibrium expression, and we'll see that in some example problems. Here are some examples of KSP values that give you a sense of what we call soluble and insoluble salts. Aluminum hydroxide, for example, has an extremely tiny KSP at 1.9 times 10 to the negative 33. This is a textbook definition of an insoluble salt, but it drives home the point that an extremely tiny amount of aluminum hydroxide does dissolve even though it's what we call insoluble. Solubility is a continuum. It's governed by equilibrium in the same way all chemical reactions are. And that's worth keeping in mind as you go on to more advanced studies. 
A salt like calcium fluoride is also highly insoluble with a very tiny equilibrium constant. And I'll point out a couple of other examples here. Silver chloride, classic insoluble salt, right? It's in the, it's in the solubility rules as an exception to the solubility of all halides. Lead chromate, also very small KSP value. These all indicate relatively insoluble salts. Others that are pretty darn insoluble but with slightly larger KSPs, barium carbonate, calcium carbonate. The two on this list that have the greatest solubility are lead chloride and silver sulfate, although both of these still have fairly small KSP values as well.